this form and uh, various versions of phase estimation and so on. <coughs> and today I will show you four uh, applications of, of quantum gradient computation, which are uh, all uh, of a slightly different flavor. And I would say they are non-trivial, but they very nicely fit after we built our toolbox. And so I wanted to start with a little bit of, of recap, just uh, Jordan's algorithm, because we will apply it four times today. It's uh, best to make sure to, uh, that we are on the same page on this. <coughs> so in Jordan's algorithm, uh, we our I don't know, did, do I hold it at the wrong place, or what's happening with this? There is Omar, he knows how to do this uh, properly, I guess. Didn't have issues for him. I don't know. Okay, uh, let's try to see if it's better now. Okay, so <coughs> or no, normally we had integer numbers, Zn, and we had the Fourier transform over that. But now we will treat these uh, numbers from 0 to n minus 1 as some uh, numbers which we normalize so that they, uh, they lie between 0 and 1. And uh, Yeah. I was putting it in my pocket. I was leaving it here. Do you think the and pocket matters? Work. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Okay. Well, let's see. All right. So we have uh, okay. So we have these binary numbers, which now we think of as some uh, numbers between zero and one <coughs> in binary. And so this grid will be uh, this discrete grid that we work with. And if we represent, if, if we interpret our binary numbers this way, then <coughs> uh, the quantum Fourier transform were such that uh, I if x and k were uh, in these integer numbers, we had to divide it by n to get these Fourier states. Now, because we divided both of them by n, we need to multiply this product with them. And if we have such a phase factor, uh, for every x, then the quantum Fourier transform uh, recovers the value of k in this binary representation if it's exactly uh, one of these uh, n numbers. <coughs> okay, so this is just a rescaling of how we treat these labels. And <coughs> now I assume that we have this uh, representation, then we can state Jordan's algorithm as follows. Uh, we assume that we have a phase oracle for our function. So given uh, some quantum string x, which is uh, uh, d different coordinates each in binary representation, then it will apply this phase e to the 2 pi i f of x for that uh, particular vector. <coughs> and uh, the output of this algorithm is hopefully an epsilon coordinate wise estimate of the gradient of this function. For this, we need to assume that this function is roughly linear. So f of x is something like f of 0 plus the gradient times x. So this, this linear approximation by the gradient is indeed good. <coughs> and if we have this, uh, then it works nicely uh, in the following algorithm. We just prepare uniform superposition over all the grid points by doing Hadamard's or, or something similar. And then we apply our phase oracle. And not only once, but n times. And we do that for getting n times f of x in the phase. And if our assumption was correct, that it was indeed roughly a linear function, then this phase is roughly uh, this phase corresponding to the 0 value, and then <coughs> the linear phase by the gradient. And so the function value at 0, that is just a global phase we can pull out of this superposition. And what we have here looks very similar uh, to these Fourier states. Uh, and then actually, if we just do the Fourier transform on every coordinate, then we get back 
a good binary approximation of the gradients and, e and then each of these coordinates. Uh, yes. So this is Jordan's algorithm. And <coughs> so if you look at this phase, then this is a sum of the coordinates uh, multiplied together. So I'm attempting to put it in my pocket. Maybe that's the issue. So if we have this uh, state, which is e to the 2 pi i n times x times the gradient. Now, that is the same thing as if I take, uh, and x is a vector, <coughs> if I take uh, the tensor product from i equals 1 to d, and now, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to put here the vector and the normalization. Now, this is the same thing <coughs> as I have them individually, uh, these x vectors. So here I have just the x i's, <coughs> and the corresponding phase is e to the 2 pi i, and then x i times the i th coordinate of the gradient. Okay, and here I divide by square root n. <coughs> and uh, so here I treated this, uh, this x as a vector, and it had d coordinates, and it had a phase which I treated this way jointly. But if this is my state, then this is actually a tensor product of the d coordinates and the corresponding uh, phases with those coordinates together. Uh, and because this is a tensor, tensor product state, I can just apply the Fourier transform coordinate-wise, and I get back all the coordinates. So this is the idea behind this uh, last step in Jordan's algorithm. And uh, we discussed that uh, <coughs> it, re it basically requires a quantum circuit implementation of this function. That's usually how we get these phases, or how it's described uh, in often, often cases. But if, if we have, have a recipe to, com to computing f, then this cheap gradient principle very often means that we can compute the gradient basically just as cheaply as the function itself. So I will show you applications where we cannot classically compute the function nicely, and therefore Jordan's algorithm gives a genuine speed up. OK, maybe this was the issue. Can you hear me now? Well, for some reason, it interferes with my pocket, which I don't understand because I didn't le learn this from physics. All right. Uh, let's, let's look at the first application, which is uh, application to distribution estimation. So the question here is uh, that we start with is a classical problem, and we know the classical solution to it. The question is, how many samples do we need to estimate every probability in a probability distribution to epsilon precision? So we have some probability distribution over d elements, uh, which is a non-negative vector, and we wish to estimate its entries, each to epsilon precision. Now, standard, uh, it's standard knowledge that if you take something like log 1 over epsilon over epsilon, log 1 over delta over epsilon squared samples, <coughs> then taking the average of these samples and, and, and looking at how many times you got uh, uh, the, the outcome 1 divided by the overall number of samples, that gives you an epsilon precise uh, estimation of P1 with success probability at least 1 minus delta. And this, this is standard. You can prove it using the Chernoff bound, for example. But this is just estimating a single coordinate of your distribution, P1, say, or could be any other. Uh, but now the trick is that if you are choosing your delta, your success probability, to something like, uh, like 1 over d, then if you take log d over epsilon square samples, then for every uh, coordinate i individually, you get an epsilon precise approximate with probability, uh, with, with failure probability, some, something like 1 over dimension. And if you just apply the union bound, 
So what's the probability that any of my coordinate estimators fail to produce an epsilon precise estimate? I just add up the individual failure probabilities, which were all something like 1 over d or 1 over 2d. And then they all together sum up to a number smaller, uh, say, 1 third, if I choose yeah, d, sorry, delta, something like 3d, 1 over 3d. <coughs> and then by the union bound, I get an estimator, which is good for all my coordinates simultaneously, not only for one of them. And so the increase in the number of samples was something logarithmic in the number of different outcomes of my distribution, uh, or different outcomes of my experiment, so the size of my distribution, uh, which is a very nice thing. And uh, so we would be hoping to get something similar quantumly. And so the question is, how can we prove this uh, algorithm in a quantum case? We often can remove this epsilon square dependence and make it eps one over epsilon dependence. Uh, and well, for first of all, for this, I need to define uh, an access model to my distribution. So previously, I just assumed that I can get samples from my distribution. But that's a classical model. Now I want to do some quantum operations on it. Uh, so the, the corresponding thing here when that we can work with is that we can assume that we assume that uh, we can prepare these samples as quantum states in the sense that we have some unitary V, and on the all zero state, V prepares a superposition of these I labels, maybe with some garbage state, this psi I some garbage attached, uh, such that if we would measure this state, then this first register would give output i with probability pi. So this is a very natural uh, quantum analog of, of uh, classical sampling. Uh, and this is a weakest natural assumption when you have some coherence in your input model. Uh, and just uh, as an example, why this is reasonable to have such an assumption is Think, for example, if you have some classical procedure to produce your, your samples. Maybe you are running some Monte Carlo algorithm. Now, running this Monte Carlo algorithm on your quantum computer instead is exactly providing you this kind of access. This gives you a coherent way to prepare your samples, and then the probabilities are indeed correct, just how it comes out from your quantum computer. Uh, OK. And and so it's important that sometimes people assume a stronger uh, input model when, when this garbage state is not present, but that makes it a much stronger assumption. Uh, and think about this psi i, for example, uh, if, if you consider the Monte Carlo sampling example that I told you, is that it, it kind of describes the state of your Monte Carlo sampler, how it got to that particular sample. This is in general hard to erase. so. If we assume that th there is some garbage state, then that uh, greatly uh, enhances the applicability of this result because it applies ma more generally. OK, so if we have this sort of natural access model for our distribution, uh, then we can just use uh, amplitude estimation to estimate, for example, uh, the P1 value of this distribution with roughly 1 over epsilon steps. This is what we have seen. But now the question arises, uh, what can we do to get all of them together? And amplitude estimation is focusing on a single uh, probability. So this would give you something like d over epsilon, because you would need to repeat this procedure for all the coordinates. And then we had a classical algorithm, which was 1 over epsilon square, complexity up to log factors. And now you get one, which is d over epsilon. Well, this d can be very large. so you want to avoid it. This is a not so nice quantum algorithm. You want something better speed up. And this is exactly what you can do uh, by Jordan's algorithm. So amplitude estimation is, is Fourier transform in a single coordinate and gradient computation by Jordan. That's multivariate phase estimation. We can think about it that way. And that's exactly what we want here. We want to uh, estimate all the uh, entries of, the, of this distribution at the same time. So it's a natural fit, but it's not immediately clear how you uh, achieve this. And so 
For this, I would like to introduce this notion of a probability oracle, which is the following. Uh, I want to modify uh, my initial oracle, which prepared my distribution, uh, using a, a version of quantum rejection sampling the following way. So I want a unitary U, which from 0x uh, prepares a state which looks like this. Uh, basically, uh, the same thing as before, but you want to get, if, if you would uh, get outcome i of this distribution, then you want to uh, only accept it with probability xi. And so acceptance means that the first bit is qubit is set to zero. That's what I mean by accepting. And so if I would manage to prepare this state where these pi's are multiplied with, with xi's, uh, then it would mean that I accept this uh, element i with probability xi, and I need to then rotate it somehow to make it unitary. I need to, uh, to put a qubit in the one state to the rejection branch. And so how you can do this is just apply our previous uh, uh, state estimation, sta state preparation oracle. Remember, this was this square root pi i psi i. And controlled on which i you get here, and what is the xi value that I added there, you apply this rotation. So this is a rotation gate which, which puts there this square root xi amplitude. And so when, when, when you square it, you get the probability that you wish. So in particular, if the second register is in state, this vector x uh, in 0, 1 to the d, then the probability that, you, that your first qubit is in state 0 is just sum over uh, i, x, i, p, i. So you get the i -th outcome with probability p, i, and then you accept that with probability x, i. So the overall acceptance probability, which is the probability of seeing 0 in the first qubit, is just this sum, which I can also write as the inner product between the vector x and the distribution p as a vector. Yes? Yeah, so this is something I add now. I, I had the unitary v here, and I modify it by also adding a new parameter x. This is just someone gives me an x. I want to do this operation. And what I do, I first prepare this sample this way, and then I look at, OK, which i actually I got here. Then I look, OK, what is the corresponding coordinate in the vector x i? And once I know that, I apply this rotation. And this will uh, uh, do this uh, reducing probability. And ultimately, I get out, uh, I, I accept this sample with this probability. And now this vector x can be arbitrary in 0, 1 to the d. And now, as you can expect, we will later put it in a uniform superposition and do Jordan's algorithm, but we are not quite there yet. So the end goal is that we want to apply Jordan's algorithm, which is preparing uniform superposition over every grid, grid point, and then applies the phase. Well, we don't have a phase, we have a probability oracle, but we will get there. So what we managed to construct is a probability oracle where this acceptance probability is a linear function of x, this extra register that you added. It is just x times p. This is a nice linear function. Uh, OK, but this is, once again, it produces the correct probability, which is linear, but it, it's not a phase. And so now here comes the trick that we are going to convert this probability oracle to a phase oracle, exactly what is needed in Jordan's algorithm. Uh, so now I just want to reduce the clutter in this formula. So I just, uh, I just assume that I have a generic probability oracle, by which I mean that it will accept this uh, vector x with probability p of x. This is the linear function from the previous slide. Just, uh, yeah, this way I denote. It doesn't matter what are these uh, ancilla states. The only thing that matters is that I see qubit 0 in the first, uh, value 0 in the first qubit with probability p of x if I measure it. That's a probability oracle for the function p of x. 
And so this is what I constructed for the linear function that I have in mind. Uh, but what I wish to implement is a phase oracle, P of, P of x. Uh, okay, and, and so, so maybe, maybe just to, to explain for clarity, my probability is a linear function of x. So what's the gradient of a linear function? Well, it's linear in x, the gradient is just p itself. So I if I can estimate the gradient of this function, well, the gradient is exactly just the probability distribution that I have in mind, so that's the ultimate goal. Uh, understanding this distribution is the same as learning the gradient of this linear function. So this is the goal that we have in mind. Okay, and, and for that, we already constructed this probability oracle of this form, but we want to convert it to a phase oracle, and this is how we do it. So, for, as a first step, we create a block encoding, a unitary matrix, W, and W is just the following. You apply your uh, state preparation unitary and attach an, a, an, a single ancilla qubit that you just don't touch. Then you swap the first two ancilla qubits and then run the reverse of your state preparation. And so what I claim here is that uh, this is going to be a block encoding of the diagonal matrix P of X. Okay, so it means that if you set your first qubit to zero and, then, and these zero qubits of your state preparation oracle, you apply W and then, S, uh, and, uh, and then you would assume that you measure the O0 state again at the beginning, then you would get just P of X in the diagonal. And, okay, so this is a little computation that I, that is hopefully not going to be too difficult. Uh, so, So what does it mean that it's a block encoding of, of, uh, of this diagonal uh, function? That, that means the following, that if I start with the matrix element of W, which is just this, uh, X of Y, Okay, so this should be delta x, y, p of x. Okay, this is what it means. It's a diagonal matrix, and p of x is in the middle. And so if you write out what was the definition of w, uh, well, you need to apply the state preparation for this state and that state. So <coughs> that would be something like, you get a zero, and then uh, that with the identity doesn't change, another zero, and then you get this uh, psi except. And this is happening with square root p of x. Okay, and then there is something starting with a one, but we think about that, that will fall out. And here we have the swap, tensor identity. And then I apply, again, this state preparation on the other side. So that will be square root P of Y, and then 0, and uh, one second a 0, and then this psi except state and plus something starting with, with one. But I don't care about that. Uh, sorry, starting with zero, one. And here also starting with zero, one. Okay, so I have some states here with zero, zero, and here zero, one, zero, one. Now when I apply the swap gate, say to this guy, then this will become a one, zero. And this one zero will not meet with this other guy zero one. They they just don't have anything. So this term will fall out because of the swap gate. And the only thing I remain uh, that remains is this thing here. And uh, and I'm sorry I forgot to mention that this oracle crucially keeps 
uh, lying around the vectors that you started with, the x and y vectors. So I have some state with x here, and some acceptance state, and some probability uh, square, rooted, uh, square root. And here the y, some accepting state, and p of y. And well, they only have a non-zero inner product if this x equals y. So that is exactly this delta x, y times, well, these two square rooted probabilities just multiply, so it will be p of x. OK? So hopefully this convinces you that this simple circuit is indeed a block encoding of the diagonal matrix containing the p of x values in the diagonal. OK, so uh, p of x, that's a non-negative number, certainly a real number. Now, because it's diagonal matrix, it's, it's also symmetric. So there is nothing preventing me from thinking about this diagonal matrix as Hamiltonian. I can just say it's a Hamiltonian, sure, fine. But then I can use the well-established techniques for implementing Hamiltonian simulation, which in this case would mean that I can implement uh, this uh, operator. And uh, I'm sorry for here. Uh, this is just the phase, but what is missing from there, from this slide, uh, there is missing this term. So it keeps the value of this vector x. So I have this sum over x times the phase e to d. So whatever phase I wrote here should be multiplied and summed up with over all, all the x's. So uh, this is exactly a phase oracle, which now applies my phase n times. And because of the complexity of Hamiltonian simulation, we know that uh, doing this uh, exponentiation of this Hamiltonian basically has cost roughly n up to some log factors. And this is now just a phase oracle, because given a vector x, it applies the phase, exactly this e to the i times n times diag p of x. So I managed to convert uh, my probability oracle to a phase oracle. And well, here, because I know what I have in mind, Jordan's algorithm, it's going to be n times this uh, value. And so now we have everything ready. We have a phase oracle for the function p of x, which was just in a product between x and p, which grad whose gradient is the probability distribution p itself. So now you just need to choose your precision parameters, so n equals 1 over epsilon, and use Jordan's algorithm for estimating this entire distribution with only 1 over epsilon uses of v, the preparation circuit for your distribution. Yes? Yeah, 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 but everything is logarithmic, so I didn't want to confuse with where these failures come in. There is some, with this O tilde height, something like logarithmic in the failure probability and these kind of factors. Yeah. <coughs> and, okay, so this is one thing. This is if, if you use this ordinary phase estimation that you get this. But we have studied advanced versions of phase estimation. So if instead of using this uniform superposition over this grid, and over these vectors x, we can just use the Gaussian distribution uh, over all coordinates. So I get an overall Gaussian starting state for x. <coughs> and if I use uh, Jordan's algorithm with that, so it meaning that each individual phase estimation at each coordinate is like the Gaussian, <coughs> then it's not only going to be an estimate of p with 1 over epsilon precision, but it will always also be unbiased estimator with Gaussian noise. So you get the best uh, estimator that you can hope for, basically, using just this advanced version of phase estimation in Jordan's algorithm. All right. Yes? Sorry, I don't hear you. Which function is which? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> it is this. X in a product P. Why is it what, sorry? <coughs> so 
on this slide, I showed you how from being able to prepare uh, a distribution P, in the sense that I described, you can, cons uh, you can, you can uh, transform this ability to prepare this distribution P to a, to a probability oracle, which outputs a qubit zero with probability x times p in a product. <coughs> so this is a number between zero and one, and the probability that my circuit will output zero is exactly this. And, 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 and it depends, yeah, sorry, this should be a vector x. So this is the x vector the times p uh, in a product. So th this circuit <coughs> just uh, achieves that, if you are inputting a vector x, then it will output the zero qubit on the first qubit with probability this x times p in that product. So this is a probability oracle. And in the next slide, I showed you how from any probability oracle, I can construct a phase oracle. So, okay, I try to maybe write something. Okay, so probability of zero given x to this circuit. So this is a, if you put vector x in your ancilla, the probability of seeing zero in the first qubit, that equals in that product between x and p. Okay, this is what I constructed. And this is what I will call the function p of x. Okay? And this is a linear function. So in particular, the gradient of p of x is just my distribution. It's a linear function. Okay? And so I constructed phase oracle for this function p of x. And then uh, I just converted it to uh, now a phase oracle, which was uh, mapping x to e to the i. And well, I multiplied with the phase factor because Jordan's algorithm in mind. Okay, so these are the steps. Does it clarify it? Okay, thanks. Yes? Yes? No, 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 because quant because classically it's log d over epsilon square. Well, <coughs> yeah, if, if you are interested in total variation distance, that's a different story. <coughs> there are also improvements there, but yeah, that's a bit different. Uh, the next, the next, yeah. But, you know, you may be interested in histogram. So I'm just, this particular uh, uh, speed up, in, if you are executing this algorithm, that's exactly doing histogram estimation to epsilon precision. This is a meaningful task. I will show the next example, maybe clarifies it even more. It's a quantum generalization that I will show you. But for this particular problem, the classical complexity is one over epsilon square. This algorithm is one over epsilon. Yeah, total variation distance, if you wanted to convert this to total variation distance by just naively doing it, that's not going to the best algorithm for uh, Okay, I'm, okay. I, I would not double check what is the actual complexity in total variation distance. Maybe you get the same complexity, but this is more complicated. So yeah, if you want total variation distance, this is not the algorithm of your choice. But this is an optimal algorithm for this particular uh, distribution estimation task. Okay, so yeah. Many 
Uh, yeah, it's a good, good question why you don't uh, violate whole levels bound. Uh, maybe you don't learn that much information, actually. I mean, <clears throat> your distribution is mostly going to be zero. Uh, so it's similar in the classical case. That's also why the classical case, it actually works, right? So it's true that you have d coordinates, but m most of them will be zero, or uh, yeah, or very small, and then you basically you just output zero for that particular value. And that's fine. It's going to be epsilon precise. So like the classical intuition is, I think, the best here. Okay. So I would like to describe on a high level uh, another application. So this was kind of tomography for distributions. So let's move to tomography of quantum states. OK, that's the next level. And so here, again, I need some, some sort of coherence to get some improvement compared to just sampling. And so I will assume the following input model. I have once again a state preparation unitary V, which in the O0 state prepares a pure state on two registers A and B. And this uh, pure state is such that if you are tracing out the first register of it, then you get some mixed state row on the register B. OK, this is my assumption. So this is an access model for the uh, density operator, the mixed state row. And uh, it's, a, it's a coherent access model to this particular mixed state, by, defined by its purification. And so in tomography, what we want to do is we wish to estimate rho to precision epsilon in trace distance. And the motivating example would be, for example, maybe you can prepare some many-body quantum states people often want to understand its, re its reduced density matrix on a few particles. Okay? Suppose you can prepare your many-body state and want to understand how the reduced density matrix looks like on, I don't know, qubit 1, 2, 3, or something like this. Then since you can prepare the entire state, you have that, just trace out the rest of the qubits, and you get your density operator that way. Now, how can you estimate it uh, precisely? And well, uh, in physics, the natural notion is, trace est uh, is estimation in, in trace distance, which would be the uh, one plane log of total variation distance that you asked before. Uh, yes, so once again, the idea is to consider a linear function whose derivative is exactly the density operator that we look for. So here is a linear function from x, which is a matrix. I wanted to map it to trace x rho. The trace is a linear operation, and so its derivative with respect to the matrix X will be rho itself. So it's a very similar strategy as before, but a more complicated setting. And okay, to understand how this algorithm will work, uh, I just go through it on a high level. So once again, I will think about the coordinates of X, the matrix elements of X as my coordinates. So I will. Uh, just sample them uniformly at random from minus one to one. So uh, ultimately, I will set a superposition with such a way. OK, so matrix elements come from minus one, one. Uh, and because I need to somehow implement my x in a quantum computer to, to compute this linear function, uh, I actually need, need x to be normalized. Now, unfortunately, in the worst case, for example, if all my random choices happen to be one, then I get the all ones matrix. And the O1 matrix has operator norm D. That's too bad. That's, that's large. I already lose a factor of D there. However, it turns out that due to the matrix chain of bound, apart, if you are choosing all your matrix elements uniform random minus 1, 1, <coughs> then apart from some exponentially small probability, the norm of your matrix will be only square root D, as opposed to the worst case, which is D. Uh, which is good. So if, if, if my uh, matrix X has square root D, then I can just normalize it by roughly square root D and then work with it in a quantum computer. And um, generalization of this idea of how I could build uh, a diagonal matrix with diagonal entries, which were this uh, P of X before, I can do this here as well. But because of this normalization issue, I can build a block encoding of a diagonal matrix, which is this trace x row divided by square root d. And well, this trace x row is also can be 
This is the same as the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product of x and rho. If you know this stuff, if you don't know, just stick to trace of x. I just put this Hilbert-Schmidt form here just to exact analogy with the previous case. Uh, so uh, the only difference is from the uh, probability case that uh, because of this normalization, I cannot directly build a, a diagonal matrix of this linear function, but divided by square root d. But I can do that. And so once I have this diagonal matrix, which for every matrix x or every uh, like discrete representation of this matrix x, we'll, we'll put this value in the diagonal. I once again do Hamiltonian simulation and convert it to a phase oracle. But because I had this subnormalization here, now the cost will be in increased by square root d. So if I do this conversion to phase oracle and apply Jordan's algorithm, now I will get a square root d over epsilon. So you state preparation oracle, I will get an epsilon coordinate wise uh, sample uh, estimator of rho, the density operator I care about. Okay, because this was a linear function, its derivative is once again rho. Uh, and moreover, uh, my individual coordinates will be roughly independent because of the tensor product structure of this, of this phase state. Okay, and why the, the reason why I put here almost because I cannot build this block encoding for every x, only the majority of x's, because of this tiny pro issue that for some outlier matrices it will have a higher norm and then my algorithm will fail, but that's exponentially small probability, so I can just forget about it. So it will be roughly an independent estimator for every entry of my density operator with precision epsilon. And so far I spent square root d over epsilon resources. <coughs> okay, now once again, uh, if all these errors would line up in one direction, then my error would be d times epsilon. But I wanted to do something like operator norm or trace norm later, but first consider operator norm. Uh, but if all my errors line up in the same direction, then they will be d times epsilon uh, error in operator norm. But because these samples are independent, and I make them unbiased using the unbiased phase estimation, I, I get a much smaller error. So with, with, with exponentially high probability, my error will be only epsilon times square root d in the operator norm. Ah, uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so now I have epsilon times square root d estimate in operator norm, and just converting norms, uh, if my density operator has ra rank r, then it implies an epsilon r square root the estimator of the density operator in trace norm. Okay, so, so far I spent square root d or epsilon and got this precision. My ultimate goal would be epsilon precision, so I need to further increase this uh, number of uses of v. And what it, if you just multiply these costs, you get d times r over epsilon complexity. So you can learn a rank r density operator of dimension d with that many uses of the state preparation oracle. And this is once again a quadratic improvement in the precision. Because if you would only get samples of these, uh, <coughs> of these uh, density operators, then it would be dr over epsilon square. And this is optimal. So uh, in, the, in the sample case, dr over epsilon square is optimal. And in this more advanced case, when we have a state preparation oracle for the purification, then it's dr over epsilon that's also tight. So Jordan's algorithm with now unbiased error that gives rise to this estimator. And here, for this chain of matrix chain of bounds, it was essential that our estimators were coordinate-wise unbiased. And so this was the motivation for developing these techniques originally, because now this gives you an optimal algorithm for this purified density operator estimation. Yes? Sorry, I can't hear you properly. Okay, so I, I, I just glossed over the technical detail. So how you actually block encode this matrix 
you somehow need to prepare this matrix X as a block encoding, somehow apply to row, but you know, you can only prepare a block encoding of a matrix of norm one. And if it, well, so I need to reduce the norm. Well, in most cases it suffices to reduce the norm by square root D to make my X have norm at most one. In worst case, I would need to reduce it by, by D. And so but what I do instead, I just, I just assume that my matrix has norm at most square root D. I reduce the norm by square root D and block encode. And in the unfortunate case when my X matrix was actually a matrix of larger norm, then something other thing will happen. It will just, my block encoding will do something arbitrary. It will be error. But that will only happen with exponentially small probabilities, so it's fine. So, so like understanding this is going a little bit under the hood, which I don't want to do here. But basically, that's the idea that I need a block encoding of the matrix X, and that requires X to be normalized. And it, yeah, this is normalization that works for most Xs. Uh, well, no, I, I just block encode this, and my procedure will work for every axis which have operator on at most square root D, and I do this for a huge superposition over lots of X values. And some of those X values will actually not satisfy this thing. Their, their operator norm will be actually larger than square root D, and there, at that particular point, my phase will be incorrect. There's something bad happens, but that's only a tiny, tiny fraction of all the points on which I apply the phase oracle, and that's fine. It can tolerate a little bit of error. Yes? <coughs> so yeah, once again, the, the strategy as in the classical case was to first create the block encoding of the linear function. And because of these normalization things, you cannot block encode with a single code x times rho, or trace x rho. It turns out for these technical reasons, you can, you can, and that will give rise to a uh, block encoding of trace x rho divided by square root d. This is just what comes out, because in fact, you will not work with the matrix x directly in your quantum algorithm, but you will work with your matrix x divided by square root d, and that exactly gives you this dependence. Yeah, so this is just the normalization that comes into this. Yeah, so because you have this reduced, uh, so now it's your Hamiltonian is like shrinked by a factor square root d. So you would need apply Hamiltonian stimulation square root d times more to get back to the original phase that you want it to have. Okay, so ha having a block encoding reduced by some factor, in this case square root d, means that your Hamiltonian stimulation is square root d times more costly to get the phase. Yeah, so subnormalization hurts you. Okay, yeah, so this was an uh, application to uh, state tomography. And so what should I do here? Uh, okay, I was talking about this, that if you have now a nonlinear function, in, in the early applications, actually I constructed a linear function, which was perfectly linear, so I didn't need to worry about nonlinearities at all. Uh, in the general case, when I have nonlinear functions, uh, then I somehow need to make sure that they look almost linear at the region when I look at them. And one uh, method for that was just zooming into the function around the point, which works nicely. However, one second it reduces my phases, and it means that if I zoom into my function r times, then I need to apply my phase oracle r times more at, at the end. <coughs> and that's not really good, but then there is a nicer method as opposed to zooming into your function, you can also use some numerical differentiation formulas to, to basically kill the nonlinear terms. So for example, <coughs> uh, I, can, I can define my, my function uh, f prime, and that would be basically uh, just evaluate the function at point x and and at, at minus x and, and uh, subtract them, divide by two. Now this is only two evaluations of the function, but it completely clears, uh, kills the second order term. So 
imagine that you have a smooth function that has some constant terms, some linear terms, some quadratic, some cubic, and so on in your Taylor approximation, in your Taylor uh, ex expansion. And if you manage to kill the second order term, then your error will be only third order, and so on. And with this single formula, you can kill the second order terms, and it has higher order analogs, and you can basically kill all, all uh, order terms up to some order k with uh, something like k evaluation of the function only. And this is much nicer than zooming into it. It's much more efficient. Uh, and, well, OK, I let me just state the result here that if you have some, just on a high level, if you have some nice analytic function, which is in some sense C smooth, uh, then this smoothed version of this gradient computation gives you something like square root d over epsilon complexity, which is if in, in, in the case when you happen to have a polynomial function, then it has only up to order k uh, terms. So with a order k uh, numerical differentiation formula, you can kill all nonlinear terms. So in that case, the quiddy complexity would be k over epsilon. And in the general case, it, yeah, this, this comes down to the geometry of these high dimensional functions. Everything comes out to square root d over epsilon. OK. Uh, so, and this third application would be uh, the optimization of, of these parametrized stochastic circuits. And this would be examples that you see uh, in a lot of cases these days. Uh, some, some stochastic circuits, which are, for example, uh, quantum machine learning, variational circuits. Uh, and uh, sorry, I just skip a few slides here. OK, so I, I would like to explain this slide better for you. So uh, when you do, for example, a variational eigensolver, or an approximate optimization algorithm, or something other quantum machine learning stuff, usually what happens is that you have some ansatz circuit. This is in this box. And this ansatz circuit has some fixed elements, like C nodes, other fixed rotations, ex exits, whatnot, and some parameterized gates. And what you do, you are tuning the parameters of these rotation gates and similar things, and you hope that you, for example, prepare a low energy state or something. And so this is your ansatz circuit. And maybe in, variation, in, in variational uh, eigensolvers, you want to prepare a high overlap with the ground state. So once you prepare the state, maybe your verification circuit would somehow verify the energy of your state or something. So you have a parameterized circuit, and then a verification circuit, which tells you the quality of your state. And uh, basically, the quality would be how big is the probability of measuring 0 in the last qubit. That's like basically. You can pretty much convert everything in this sense uh, into this form. And so your quality is, is, the, is, is the better if you have a smaller probability of measuring 0 after verification. And basically, all these QA, OA, quantum variational circuits, and so on, quantum machine learning, when you want to optimize your ansatz circuit, is of this model. And so how do you optimize it? You compute the gradient of this of this uh, of this objective value which is encoded in the probability of measuring zero and then you adjust your rotations so this is a very generic view of these variational circuits and now the trick is that you want to tune your parameters in superposition this is not that something people do today but in the long run maybe you want to do that so imagine that your parameterized rotations and other gates would be now controlled by some qubits that describe the value. And with respect to these qubits, you could compute the gradient of this optimal value, uh, of, of this objective value. And that's, once again, uh, can be modeled as a probability oracle. So basically, given your parameters for your ansatz circuit, you get a probability outcome for 0, which you want to optimize by computing the gradient and, and uh, adjusting your parameters. And so you just uh, convert your probability oracle to a phase oracle, then smooth it out using these numerical formulas that I told you, 
and apply Jordan's algorithm. And what it gives you that you can compute the gradient of your variational circuit to epsilon precision per coordinate with square root d over epsilon uses of your circuit. And it turns out that if you just assume that your parameterizing s parameterized circuit is a black box, you don't really understand the structure, just um, basically can only infer anything from it by measuring this output qubit. Under this black box assumption, black box assumption, actually, this is optimal. You cannot do better. So if you want to learn the gradient to epsilon precision, then the cost of this is square root of epsilon, which is bad news. Because you would imagine that in the long run, you would have a zillions of parameters, and you want to optimize them for a long time. And this is what is happening in classical machine learning. They, have, they want to optimize their neural networks uh, by a lot of gradient steps. But then they have this backpropagation and this cheap gradient principle. They can very efficiently evaluate uh, <coughs> to very high precision their gradients. However, in the quantum version, there is no quantum backpropagation. Back you cannot do better than this complexity than using Jordan's algorithm to learn the gradient. And this is a warning sign for me that these variational uh, circuits will probably not be the future of quantum computers. So maybe when you use small quantum computers noisy, then it makes sense. But I think once we have large quantum computers, they will be very hard to train because it's very costly to evaluate the gradients unlike in classical machine learning. So for that reason, uh, yeah, this is a fundamental limitation, which is very different from the classical case, when you can compute basically the precision dependence on your, on, of your gradient computation is logarithmic in the precision. And when you work with very high dimensional objects, you probably va want very high precision. Too bad. OK, and this is the final example. And now this is a classical application. I told you that when you can evaluate your function uh, with an arithmetic circuit, then you have the chief gradient principle. But now there is a setting where this doesn't work. And this is the setting of convex optimization. You have a convex body. This is this, dark, uh, this more dark, more deep purple here. And you want to optimize over this object, th this body. Uh, and for this, people usually assume two types of different access models to this convex body, which is you know, living in very high dimensional space, hard to understand. Uh, one thing is when you want to optimize, maybe you want to find some in, in some direction the extreme point. One thing is when you can ask from any point whether it's in your set or not. That's called the membership query. And the stronger one is separation query. When you, when you, if you are outside your set, you don't only get a no answer that no, you are not in the set, but you also get a separating hyperplane, which separates your point from your convex body. And most efficient algorithms that, use, uh, that are used in convex optimization actually assume this, this separation oracle. Uh, and, and you can, uh, in fact, classically construct a separation oracle from a membership oracle. Uh, but that requires dimension many queries, as you would expect. But in the quantum case, uh, you can basically just look, imagine that this is the point which happens to be not in your uh, convex set. And so your membership query told you, well, unfortunately, you are outside a convex set. But it doesn't tell you a separating hyperplane. Now, from this point, you can look at the convex body. And then it will be a convex function here. Convex function, and it will be mostly have something like derivative or sub subgradient at every point. So subgradient estimation is very similar to gradient estimation. And while it turns out that basically, given binary search, you can efficiently evaluate this function. And once you can evaluate this function with, with your binary search over the, basically, you're just like asking points until you hit the boundary or I get very close. This is the binary search. And this way, you can, you can basically uh, compute the plot of this function. And once you can compute this function, you can apply gradient computation by Jordan. And a gradient at this point will be just a separating hyperplane. So this shows you that uh, basically only a with a few membership queries, you can get a full separating hyperplane on a quantum computer, which is exponentially better than in the classical case when you need re really d queries. And in some cases, 
Indeed, it's the case that you have membership queries, but you don't know how to get separated hyperplanes. And in this case, you could get an exponential speed up for this classical problem on a quantum computer. But I must tell you that this is not a very uh, often situation. So if you have any problem of this sort in mind where this cute technique could be applied, then please tell me. And yeah, with that, I, end, I finished the fourth uh, e example application and then see you at the exercise session.